Hey everybody, it's Rajesh here. And Tane here. Welcome to our podcast, Baskets of Knowledge, Chats with a Difference. In our podcast, we invite guests from around the country and around the world to talk about how they got to where they are at the moment. It's about a journey, it's about an experience, it's about their life. Kia ora koutou everybody, welcome to a special episode of Fast of Knowledge. It's special because it's Good Friday, but also we have another fantastic guest and hopefully you're all doing fantastic wherever you are. Tane, what have you been to your Fast of Knowledge since we last spoke? I think something I've been challenged with over the last week or so, um, particularly in my coaching space, but I guess in life in general, has been changing the narrative to always being open-minded to you know criticism, but more so feedback. And I think you know going into spaces where you start to get comfortable and you start getting into a routine it's also nice to you know be aware that there are other ways of doing things because I think sometimes we get so caught up on okay I'm doing it this way and this way works but it might not actually be the best way for you and sometimes you know someone will come along and say oh have you thought about this and you have never really thought about it so just being open to you know open to suggestions and open to changing the way you're doing things, I think, has been really valuable because you do sometimes, you know, just get stuck in that rhythm and there's nothing, obviously there's nothing wrong with it, but at the same time, it's cool to see that there are other avenues you can explore. That's so, that's so true. And, and I like that because when I, when my, my coaching world that I do, my coaching world, um, when, when the clients I work with, this is what a coach does. They bring in a different perception that you don't, you don't actually see, haven't, haven't ever seen because you're just living your life the way you are. And you're also seeing the ways that, things that work for you just to go that but you can actually think something different and that's why a coach needs a coach a coach needs a mentor everybody every one of us needs a mentor to help us do things um yeah and i think that's what i this week this week one of the biggest things that i that i thought about was um boundaries you know how do you have your boundaries and how do you you would have seen my instagram post yesterday it was inspired by, by the mm-hmm. boundaries and the boundaries and how you need to make sure that it's always easy to go yes 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 but saying no sometimes is all good as well because you've got to protect yourself and energy as well. Because we all, I think both of us here yeah, love to just give our energy to help lots of people. <laughs> and sometimes yeah. we do a bit too much and then the mm-hmm. contact about us because we don't see it. But hey, that's enough about us. Um, as always, um, I'm sure we'll segue into this during a conversation as well. For our listeners out there, for our regular listeners out there, for our new listeners out there, um, we try and go around the world, around the country to pick up people that we think are amazing. And as always, as I say this, every single person we think out there is amazing, but we can't interview everybody. So we have to interview one or two people that we um, that we can access and speak to. And tonight's guest or today's guest is, an, is a person that I have been really, really honored and privileged to work with a few years ago. And it's really our honor and privilege to welcome Kylie Price, KP, onto our podcast. Welcome, KP. Kylie Price, what should we call you? What, what do we call you? What do we call you? I just... <laughs> KP is fine. KP, KP is fine. Awesome. Awesome. KP, yeah. KP. Happy Good Friday. Happy Good Friday to you. I think yeah. yours is almost finished, isn't it? Mine's just yeah. beginning. Yeah, almost, I was almost done, but hey, we'll, we'll just take yours as well. Why not? Extend the long weekend. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. KP, KP, for our listeners out there who don't know anything about you, do you want to tell them a bit about who you are right now and where you are in the world? Um, so I am uh, a singer songwriter. Um, I am from Otipoti, um, but um, I am now in London. Um, I am in East London, and I moved over in April last year uh, for music, and I've just been doing doing that for the last last year. And um, I worked with you at the university, PJ, um, in twenty twenty and twenty twenty one. So, yeah, it's it's. Uh, it is a few years ago now, actually, although it feels like yesterday. So, it sure yeah. does. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to blame the whole pandemic thing as a, a bit of a time warp. You know, nobody actually knows what happened in that, those that time. Then it's just yeah, we've all blocked it. Yeah. yeah, and we've all just woken up in 2023. Yeah, that's totally. And life is normal. I just felt before everything just normalized. <laughs> so funny. Yeah, what pandemic? But- Exactly. What are you talking about? What are you talking about? So, KP, you're 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 doing you're doing the singer songwriting stuff in London now, which is pretty amazing. But let's let's go back a little bit. If I said to KP when she was finishing up at school, "Hey, KP, in a few years' time, you'll be in London doing this," what would you have said to myself or to Tane? Um, is this like eighteen? Like finishing 18, high when, school? When you finish high school? Is that when, 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 when we're when when speaking? Okay. Yeah. Well, considering that I was enrolled into Otago Uni at that time um, 
I probably, oh, part of me might have believed you, but part of me also might have thought you were, you were just having a bit of a laugh at the same time. Um, so yeah, I, I always thought I would leave New Zealand, but I, I wasn't sure where I would go or where I would end up. Um, London was always an option, but it probably wasn't my first choice. Um, so, so yeah, there would have been a little bit of, eh, I'm not sure if you're on the right path there, PJ, but also a little bit of, well, maybe he sees something that I don't. So it's just pretty yeah. crazy because like you said, you know, lots of people in New Zealand go overseas. It's part of the, the New Zealand way of life, you know, and I think I'd only learned about it when yes. I moved here. When I moved here, I was like, why does everyone move away? This makes no sense to me. Yeah. Yeah, growing up in Africa, like why do we nobody moves away? They go away for a holiday and they come back and everyone who goes goes away and they never seem to come back. They just go away and they come back like yes. ten years later. It's pretty crazy, right? Yeah, the the all the all the Brits over here, they all wonder why we've come over to London <laughs> and why we've left New Zealand. But I think I think because they're such polar opposites, um, we have a lot of space in New Zealand. You know, we've got a lot of lot of greenery, we've got a lot of forests and nature. Whereas here, it's it's a bit of a concrete jungle. So I suppose you always look for what you don't have in your natural environment or or where you've where you've grown up. So for us, London is a whole new world um, because it's very different to Dunedin um, and New Zealand as a whole, and vice versa. If you are from the UK and you go to New Zealand, all of a sudden your kids can go play outside, and you can live in a house that is not attached to a row of houses um and yeah your kids can go running down down the street and play on their bikes and all of that sort of stuff so yeah I think we always look for what we we don't have um, yeah. in our life and also if we don't know we don't know we don't know right so when you go over there you go yeah. oh, wait, this is not what I expected I didn't picture this and you go it's very different to what I pictured in the same way around right um because you yeah, see all these exactly. amazing pictures and stuff and people tell you stuff you know well this is people didn't show me the dirt and all the traffic and the smoke. I don't pick, picture that there. And you go, okay, yeah. cool. This is real. This is real. So like, yeah, okay. yeah. You you take you take the good with the bad. I think. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. As any place that you live. Yep. Totally. Hundred yep. percent. And and let's go back to let's talk about your your story, um, KP. So um, music has always been part of your life, or is it something that was interesting, interesting in your life at some point, and then you've just that, that's been your jam. No pun intended. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, I was always into music, um, but I had other interests, and at times those interests took over, I guess, the lead. Um, so when I I started guitar when I was seven, um, and I started singing when I was ten, but I was really into sport growing up. Um, I was the captain of the athletics team at nationals. Um, I was a sprinter, not that you would recognize those characteristics now. Um, so yeah, I was heavily into sport. I was a swimmer. Um, and slowly, I think when I was 13 or 14, somebody said to me, you know, if you want to be serious about singing, you might have to start working a bit harder. Um, and you might need to start prioritizing that if that's what you want. And so yeah. I was kind of presented with that thought at 13. Um, and so I, that's when I kind of fully started, started practicing. I started saying no to things and prioritizing music and um, yeah. So it's always been, it's always been there, but if, as I said, I've had other interests as well. It's pretty crazy that because, you know, you mentioned this, which I see a lot in young people, you know, a lot of young people do so many cool things at that age, you know, between the ages of, let's say from 11 to maybe 13, 11 or 10 to 13, when you have all this exposure to sports and cultural activities, and then that age, you have to decide, you know, it's so crazy that you, yeah. like you, you have all these awesome things and you have to now decide, how did you, how did you go through that? Though? Because that's, that's a big thing to make at that stage when your friends are doing all these other cool things. Yeah. Yeah. I think it came down to, um, when you're 13 and 14 and you're doing athletics as well, you move out of, say children's athletics and you start getting coaches and and competing at a, at another level so at the same time that I was being told to if I wanted to focus on music I was also being uh, presented with the question of do you want to continue your um I guess your 
current career in in sprints and in athletics um because you would have to start again prioritizing your sport over other things um and i think for me it came down to i really enjoyed singing uh when i was 13 i started competing and actually placing whereas before that i had i i hadn't been placing so all of a sudden i had this opportunity that i hadn't really found myself in before and i think that excited me and when you're 13 and 14 winning is fun um especially if you haven't had many wins before then and so i think that was whilst i don't focus on on winning um it was still one of the it was pretty cool and i thought oh well i'm doing pretty well maybe i'll stick it out and see where it goes and um yeah and then i just you know you start doing musicals and that's really cool and you start doing shows and and it kind of just keeps feeding this internal fire in you and then before you know it you're 18 years old and you've been doing it for years and yeah it's crazy that happens right you know and, and i love what you said even though you don't outwardly seek the win internally it just gives you the satisfaction the dopamine hits you know every one of us yeah. has to feel this we all, it doesn't matter what we whether it's the thing we want or yeah. not it's it's, a, it's the impact right yeah i don't think that focusing on winning is necessarily unhealthy but i do think you need to watch what the intention of it is and what you also define as a win because my wins now are far different to what i would have defined a win when i was 13 or 14 years old um so yeah it's it's a, all, all a big process um but yeah i was i was enjoying it back then for what it was so yeah was, yeah and trying to, i guess you were the same because your sports was a big part of your life at that point in time as well especially your rugby and your rugby league yeah, definitely. And I think it's interesting that you talk about this, you know, making the decision. And that's something that I had, you know, similar kind of concept growing up. And then probably more so in year nine and 10, started playing volleyball on top of rugby and rugby league. But then I had rep training, I had rugby training, I had all these commitments and something had to give. So I ended up dropping volleyball. And I guess now so with my little sister, um, she's year eight this year. So it's a similar kind of philosophy where she's going through that period too. And you've had yeah, that as well. Yeah, can, it's interesting. Yeah, sorry. And you've had that at university as well, hey, um, Tana? You've had to do that as well recently? Oh, for sure, yeah. Like, even, yeah, just figuring out what my commitments are and where they lay. But I think also it, it's kind of a double-edged sword because I understand this um, this notion of we need to, you know, like we ne- we can't do everything. But also you get better at doing things. You know, I think of all the roles I'm taking up this year and all I'm doing and you know, I would never be able to do it, you know, probably a year ago, two years ago, I don't think I'd be able to be capable of doing that. But you get so much more efficient of knowing what you're doing, but also being in the spaces that you want to be in, I think is also something you, you know, you start focusing in on the older you get. And that's so true. And that's so true. I guess, and I guess, KP, that came to you, those sort of things when you, when you started studying music at Otago, where you go, okay, this is what I was going to hone into at that stage. But again, with your program, you could study anything with music. And how did you find navigating that as you now transfer from um, enjoying music as a hobby to now formal training at a university where it's a little bit a little bit different with some theory and looking at that kind of that that side of music? Yeah, I think I I to fully answer that question, I have to address the fact that university was not my first choice. Um, I did not want to go to university. I am not an academic by any means. I am a kinetic learner and I really struggled throughout my entire school life um, to learn in a classroom. I really struggled to uh, feel like I was able to sit there and do it. And then I didn't realize until after I left uni that I actually have panic attacks and in, in exams um, and my entire body and system will shut down and I cannot answer one question, even though I might've gotten a hundred percent in a practice test two seconds ago. So for me, university was not part of the plan. Um, I applied for NASDA, which is the um, like performing arts acting school in Christchurch. But as soon as I'd finished my audition, I felt like that place wasn't for me. It was a very weird um, kind of vibe that I got. And so I, 
um, pulled my application from them. And then all of a sudden I was at the end of my year 13 and we were graduating and I had to do something. So my parents said, why don't you go to university? Because it's not a waste of your time. You can go study music and you can still go and sing and do whatever else you're doing. And so I did that. And I think if I had studied anything else other than music, it would have been quite hard to juggle because my lecturers were so flexible with me. Um, I would be away for two weeks competing in Australia or songwriting in Australia. And essentially that was what they were trying to teach us to do. I was just doing it during that time. So they would say, you know, you can, you can sit your exam when you come back or you can sit your assessment beforehand. Um, they were really, really flexible with me. So I, I also don't think I would have gotten my degree without their help. Um, so it was, it was a juggling, it was definitely a juggling act. I learned a lot at uni about having to show up um, because, you know, at school there's a role and your parents get called if you don't show up. But at uni, no one cares if you don't show up. You're the only one that's um, going to be missing out there. So that was a very quick um, learning lesson for me so yeah it was it was definitely a, a juggling act in terms that's, of putting all the pieces together that's so crazy because you know um this just the jump from universities from school to university is so crazy at school everything is given to you and you like you said the roll call and blah 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 blah. and then within a space of two months you have to all change your whole persona where you have to all the yeah. responsibility which i really find really interesting in human psyche that just because you leave school all of a sudden you're an adult I, I just find that really yeah and the more and more I do this this job I'm like you know these young people are still young people they nothing has changed in them they just are not at school yeah and you know when you say yeah that, and it's so crazy like, yeah and especially because we both work well still there um for schools liaison we see these kids come through in their year 13 especially the ones who are coming down to Otago and living in a residential college um, and like you said, they they uphold their whole life, they move, they have to be held accountable for their actions now because mum and dad are on the other side of the country, as well as study full time, as well as having to sort out bills or sort out their doctor's appointments. And we, we see them come in and some of them, you know, obviously I was in the background, but I would sit there and go, I don't do you know what's coming like do you know what what's about to change in your life which is literally everything and my fiance was one of those people who came down from he came down from Waihee which is a small a small coastal town um up north and he went flatting in his first year with his with his sister and some friends and his whole life changed that way um, where he had to cook, he had to clean, he had to get himself to class, he had to get himself to work in a new city, full-time study, didn't know anyone, had to make friends. And you just kind of go, it's almost, that's not a normal situation for an 18, 17, 18 year old to be, to be in. But they quickly, like you said, in two months, they have to adapt very quickly. Yeah. And I, I'm with you. I find it so fascinating to watch that and how they navigate that. It's, it's so crazy. And the thing is, it's all around the world. Every, everywhere in the world, when you go to university, there's assumptions straight away you have to just grow up in two months. Um, I'm, I'm just blown away. I think yeah. about my, my experience because I went to university in South Africa. So one, one, one week I went home with my parents in Zimbabwe. <laughs> you know, just there, they're still there doing everything. And the next week I'm in another country and I have to know how to do everything. Yeah. I'm like, what? This is so crazy, you know. And at that point, I'm going to think about it. But as we work in this role, and I just see this over and over again, I'm like, how is this okay? I mean, I mean, sure, it works out, but I'm like, man, this is crazy. This is expectation assumption yeah. that, just, that we just throw on, you know, on humans, really, essentially, which is pretty crazy. And I guess, Tana, you would have seen that in your, in your time as a, as a subwarden, especially yeah. in the first few weeks. Yeah, and it was quite interesting to see how people navigate it, you know, because you're right, there's so many different upbringings, but essentially it's all the same fears, concerns, and pushing outside of that comfort zone. But you also see how, as you say, how quickly people can actually adapt, you know, in the space of a month, they go from not knowing, you know, where they're going, what they're doing, or what their time looks like, because all of a sudden they've actually got 24 hours in a day that, you know, they can do whatever they want essentially and then you know within a month they've figured out their schedule they know what they're doing they 
have these new friend groups they yeah it's it's an incredible sight to see in such a short time frame that's crazy then as you get older it becomes harder and harder to do that as you become an adult it's like oh how do i actually do this it's so, it's so, cr- so crazy yeah. how the mind how the mind starts playing all these things and i and i guess kylie as you move to london i mean i guess you were lucky you had lots of I mean, you might have lots of friends there but it's pretty hard right when you go to a new place and as an adult it's a little bit different yeah i think making friends as an adult is really hard i think it's a lot harder than because you unless you work with them um you don't see them all the time like you do at school you don't have classes with them you don't have as much free time um to go and hang out afterwards and especially in london we live in the east um all of our friends or majority of them live in the south southwest so they live in clapham junction putney sort of area which is a big contingent of new zealanders and australians um and so for them to at the moment get to us is over an hour which an hour at home means that you're in i don't know balclutha or (laughs) almost in in omaru so um it's yeah you know it when you make plans in london you have to stick with them because often they are very time consuming and um yeah it's hard it was hard to make that adjustment especially because i'm quite introverted so knowing that i had to put myself out there to make friends to meet people including in the music industry um it was quite daunting and it's quite overwhelming and still is but i just have a better grasp of my mental health now than when i moved here but it's still really terrifying um, but at the same time, I can also see the other side, which is what opportunity will this present and what can I take away from this and what lesson will I be taught at the end of it? So, yeah, but still, it's still bloody hard when you're from Dunedin to move to London. Yeah, it's crazy. Um, and like like Tana said before, just a double-edged sword, right? It's each side. It's like, all right, cool. If I do this, well, opportunities. If I don't do it, well, opportunities. Um, and this segues really, really, really beautifully into something that that I know you're really, really passionate about, um, KP, and that's mental health. You know, I think I know I, I know you as a person. I know this is something that you have really, really, really um, passionate about and you fought for in terms of the work that I've seen you do. Um, do you want to talk about your mental health journey and why you're so passionate about about this space here? Um, because you know, a lot of our guests yeah. that we've had on you as well have spoken about how that's been an something they didn't realize when they came when they when they moved away from their in safe environment that this has hit them from from nowhere really essentially yeah i my mental health journey i think really started when i was 12 so i it is a journey i've navigated over the years um and i you know i come from generational trauma i come from depression and anxiety i come from um suicide and and all of those really heavy things that often we we brace ourselves when we hear the words um, and there is still a lot of stigma associated with talking about it or even admitting that it's something that you might be going through at the time but my mental health journey yeah like i said started at 12. Um, i didn't really fully address it properly consciously until i was 19 um and then there are parts of my recovery which i have i have nosedived in um, when i've become conscious and aware of them and acknowledged that this was something that happened and then i've moved through that and then something else has come so it's always it's always a work in progress i am the best i've ever been now but i say that um knowing that everything could change tomorrow so I'm aware that it is not a linear journey I'm walking on, um, but I feel very passionately about talking about it openly because I know that I'm not the only one going through it. And I know that there are a lot of people who might be just starting their journey of mental health. And I know that there's, there's safety in numbers when you hear that someone else has gone through something and they're okay and that they're promoting hope because it allows your brain to go, huh, maybe I'm not alone which is the the biggest thing for me is that people don't feel like they're on their own and maybe there is hope for me and I think even if there's this lightest bit of hope that you can hold on to it's so worth it and it's so worth seeing it through um because I didn't know that life could be this great I would not have banked any money that life could be this great 
and I'm only realizing that now after getting through all of the the mud and the and the quicksand so yeah no thank you for sharing that because I think I think you raised a couple of two things that you know a couple you know there's a 12 but you didn't realize until you're 19 and you know this is this is hard because yeah no, no none of us none of us knows when this happens but the key thing is the awareness, right? The awareness. And you know, like you said, right at the start, you said when you heard the words like suicide, or even, even in the past when you heard the word counselor or therapist, we were like, what are you talking about? And I think it's changed a little bit now, depending on where you are in the world. But I think in New Zealand, it's becoming a lot more acceptable for you to say, we're going to see a counselor or a therapist or a psychiatrist. Um, and for you, how was that journey for you to, to go, right, cool, hey, at 19, I've acknowledged this is, this is, this is something I, I've got or something I'm going through. Was there a sense of relief or a sense of actually, this is now, this is, this. what, what is the sense of emotion, I guess, without putting words in your mouth? Yeah, there were, no, that's, no, no, there were a few emotions, um, I guess for context, um, I, I have gone through abuse and rape through my high school years. So that was something that was prominent from the age of 14 to 17, 18. And I did not address it or acknowledge that it had even happened until I was 19. But the choice on the day that I had to acknowledge it when I was 19 was you either, you're either admitted to a psychiatric ward or we take you now to a therapist and they decide whether or not you need to go to a psychiatric hospital, but you have a choice. These are your options, um, but it is your choice, which one, which one yep. we go down. So for me, it wasn't, I knew something was wrong. I knew I was going downhill, but I had no idea the depth of, um, of what I would have to unpack. And this is years of trauma as well as trauma, you know, from generational trauma that I hadn't even addressed. I had no idea what that was at 19, as well as navigating second year of a music degree and, the music degrees are very hands-on you have to show up they will they will quickly see if you're not there it's a very personal course you get to know your lecturers and you're obviously working with them in a, in a songwriting sense so they get to know you as well so if you miss a class chances are one of them is going to email you and go KP we haven't seen you in class for a week and I hadn't been all term because I just oh, wow. I was a mess so for me it I didn't actually have a choice whether or not I addressed it I had to address it. I was at a crossroads and it was going to cost me my life if I didn't. Um, and there were people who were, who cared enough to stand and fight that with me. Um, so I started going to therapy at 19 and it was a very slow process because I had deeply embedded everything to a part of me that I had to, I had locked it away. I didn't, I wouldn't allow myself to think about it or acknowledge it or call it out. I wouldn't physically out loud say I have been abused. Um, that came years later. So it was a very slow process just to get me to even speak at therapy. Um, so there was, but when I did say it, there was just this overwhelming sense of relief, but then an absolute fear of what that meant. It's kind of like when you get detention for the first time, and then you think, well, I, I've gone to detention now. I can never say that I haven't gone to yeah. detention before. Um, and it was like that. I've, I've said it. It's happened to me. I'll never be somebody who goes, oh, I don't know what that's like. Yeah. I don't know what, that, what it means to be abused. Um, so for me, that acknowledgement was terrifying because it, I knew from that moment my life was going to change and I didn't know how to navigate that or where I would end up, but I just had to trust in the process of seeking out help. Um, so yeah, like I said, it's still a work in progress. I've unpacked okay. a lot of it, um, but but yeah, I'm so grateful and fortunate that I was able to take that step that day and that there were people there to support me through it as well. I think there's, there's some amazing things there. I think the fact, number one, is that there's people that support you because I think that's, that's the biggest thing, that this journey is not a journey by yourself. Um, I mean, you know what, I use the word journey as a cliche, but I think it is, it, is, it is a journey because, as you said, it's not linear. Yeah. You know, I think lots of people think, yeah. oh, you go through a linear process and that's a happy day, it's hunky dory. And the reason I say this is because my, I, I, have, I have two family members at the moment that are going through this in Zimbabwe, and um, one of them has 
bipolar, bipolar schizophrenia, another one is going through anxiety and depression because of the same thing. But the acknowledgement that it is not a linear thing doesn't it is not processing in that in the community. And they're like, no, you've you've done this, therefore you should be better. There's no yeah, yeah. I said this, it's just a linear, this you've done this, it's like it's like a like a tablet, you take a tablet, you're all better. I was like, oh, it doesn't work like that, but yeah, it's really hard. you've gone to therapy work. for six months. You should yeah. be all good by now. Exactly. Yeah. What's, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Exactly. You should be all good. What are you talking about? Six months, time. Uh, it's so crazy, right? Yeah. Um, so it's a great acknowledgement that you know support and also that it's not a linear thing. Um, but also, I I love how you have become a champion for it. So you know, I know you speak at Silver Line and you do that kind of stuff there. And what does that do for you as you well as you did that when you were in Dunedin, going and actually telling people your story because. Um, a lot of young people around the country, and also young adults. It's just in fact, a lot of people. Let's just put it. It's not just. It's not just generations. It's not just young people. It's a lot of even adults go through this. When you were going, when you did that, did you feel like what did that do for you? I guess when you spoke to all these young people that were similar, different, both as you, and Tana, you've been involved in Silver Line as well. Yeah, I was going to say, were you there in 20, is it 2021? I think I spoke at Silver Lion. Did you go to that festival that year? Yeah, I believe I yeah. did. Yeah. 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 Um, it was, <laughs> it's always a challenge for me yeah. to get up and talk about it. Um, it's not something that I find comfortable, but I do find it rewarding. Um I think it was the amount of people who messaged me afterwards and told me their stories and told me that something similar had happened to them. And they were all at various parts of of their journey, um, whether they had acknowledged it, whether they hadn't, whether they had told somebody, um, whether it was something they had just acknowledged themselves. But I found it really, I, I found it as a privilege to be able to be in a position to talk about it and to be in a safe environment like Silver Lion. They put these festivals on and they do such a brilliant job of supporting not only the students, but us as speakers as well. Um, but what it meant was that I also, when I was writing my, my speech and things like that, I had to acknowledge what I was writing. I had to acknowledge what it meant to me and maybe what emotion I hadn't fully worked through with it um, and it's also really draining and it's really exhausting and I am one who even if I'm exhausted I'll keep going until I haven't realized just how exhausted I am and then I I find myself in a fluster yeah and then I just I need a minute I need a snack um so yeah I I am better now when I talk about it um but I do find it super rewarding that you can connect with people by something that you might have seen as a really negative thing that happened to you, but you can make something so good out of it. I think that's a real a real privilege, and I try and take and respect that opportunity when it's given to me and use it for good. Oh, that's really beautiful. I think that's that's been the premise of this podcast as well. You know, um, when we started this podcast, it was how do you share like you said just before a lot of people have gone through a journey that's similar or similar not be the same but very similar and that was the aim of this podcast so hey that people are going through all these journeys here and you're not alone so even if one person hears this today and goes actually hey this is something that i've gone through or be going through and it's it's okay because someone else is under and i can listen to this story and i can resonate with it so that was the purpose of this podcast and i guess the purpose of you heading out and giving those talks there and Tana, your involvement with silver line um do you want to talk about why you got involved with that yeah, I guess I don't know how I initially came to go to the festival, you know, like I'd been in and around the volunteering space and I, you know, it's not like I had any mates that were going or anything like that either. I just kind of thought it was such a cool concept and so I tagged along. But I think, I guess part of me knew that there was something underlying that I needed to acknowledge and I guess I wasn't really sure what it was, but there was something that was there. And I think the biggest thing I took away from that was just, seeing how vulnerable people can be and also be accepting of one another's vulnerability. And I think that's something I needed to acknowledge for myself because a lot of the times whenever I was down, there would always be 
someone else that was also you know struggling or having their own struggles and so I'd always kind of push it to the side and be like okay no but I'm always that person who helps others and I never really acknowledged myself in terms of you know like oh there's actually something that I'm struggling with because I didn't want to be seen as a burden and when someone else had come to me saying they were struggling so I'd always kind of pushed it to the side but I think from Silverline that was kind of as Kylie says you know it's a it's a flipping switch to you know acknowledge that something is there and that in many ways is just the first part of where you take that journey and I think often you know we don't acknowledge it because you know we know it's there but it's just and that's the weird thing right like it I don't know why it takes so much for us to actually go okay there's something there but it is such a barrier yeah yeah it's it's crazy because I think you know um it's a stigma right you've all we've all grown up in the world where it's it's a stigma that if 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 you mention this here you're going to be seen as not okay or you're weak or whatever whatever the crazy um limiting behavior is and you know it's awesome that both of you and um a lot of us do that you know we become aware and we speak to her whether it's a therapist a counselor a coach a mentor whatever you someone that you can go to and go actually hey i'm not okay and i need some i need your thoughts about this or just go and just cry or vent or whatever it is and the more you make that the more that you being we the world makes that acceptable it makes things so much so much better we're going to flip the switch now flipping switches um kylie price introverts yet a songwriter and a musician how does that how do you how do you manage that world there uh some days i'm good and some days i'm bad yeah. um, i i it's a lot of energy um and so i need to make sure that i'm conscious of putting time aside to rest and i think something particularly in our culture in new zealand is that we do not allow ourselves to rest we think that we have to work all the time otherwise we are not valuing at, or we're not using our time to its its absolute max um or also we're not deserving of the of the achievements or of the good fortune that we might receive so we work ourselves to the bone and i am trying to change that within me and saying that rest is a really good thing rest will make me turn up better rest is not weak um i'm going to say that again rest is not weak because it is something that even i'm sure tane in your in your sports you will see people push themselves to the limit and then the next day get up and do it again and again and again and again without any concept of a little bit of rest would do them the world of good and they'd be able to bounce back a bit more so um i i make sure that i literally schedule that in into my week be it today um my fiance and I are going to go into London and we're going to go look in a couple of stores and walk around and it's sunny so we're going to go feel some sun maybe eat some sushi and I'm not going to do anything music wise um and that is my rest um but it also means that I live an introverted extroverted life so I'm an introvert who lives an extroverted life and it is okay to do that I am it is I am not wrong being in an extroverted world or I am not neglecting my introverted side it is what I choose I just have to again like anything manage it so that it best works for me yeah and I love it beautifully because it's all about awareness right the awareness of of you living both yeah. worlds and all that the awareness of rest you know I could I could yeah. I'm, I'm a culprit I work way too hard I think and uh, go 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 and you know it's yeah just you something. always work Sorry, sorry, Kate. Yeah. <laughs> so you know, I think it's, <laughs> take, it's a a break. <laughs> take a break and have a snack, right? Um, it's the way yeah, to go. Yeah, have a snack. Yeah. I also I think, think it's not. I think it's not a bad thing to, like I said, I, I spent years thinking there was something wrong with me because I was introverted and because I don't get energy from going out or being in big groups of people. Um, I get it from staying home and reading or watching a series or playing guitar by myself or eating and watching a movie. And I thought there was something wrong with me because why am I in this industry, this music industry? It's always hustling. It's always busy. It's always loud. There's always lots of people. Why am I in this industry if I am introverted? Like, have I 
have I done something wrong? Am I wrong? And, you know, I acknowledge now that I can be introverted and live this extroverted life. It's just like anything. If you have high blood pressure, you might take tablets to, to help manage it. I just take time out to make sure that I can manage manage both of them and live a live a healthy life yeah i think that that's such because it's again it's awareness right the awareness that hey this is i love I, music is your passion it's your love and but also hey yeah. having, have, chilling out is also pretty good that's, that's another love for you and you just got to have the scales balanced and i think what we all do and i'm a culprit chip is we tip the scales often and yeah only when they break to realize actually we should have uh, balanced it and you know and sometimes when it breaks it's too late you know sometimes if we use the if we use the heart the blood pressure um, an analogy there if you don't look after your blood pressure something's going to happen and then you, you'll be like this you're going to do something else so um that's a fantastic yeah. analogy there. and a great learning for me i think to take away for tonight as well from tomorrow i will rest <laughs> yes yes <laughs> caught, rest. Caught that. yeah caught that um but your music career, I mean, I, I this is this is no secret. I'm a huge fan of your music. Um, I love I love I love what you put out there. It's really really cool. How has that been for you? How has your 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 trajectory started, and how is it going for you? And how have you seen that? Um, how are you are you? Do you reward yourself and you go actually this is pretty awesome what I've done? Do you take a step back and go actually this is really awesome, or is that still something that you're trying to to, to navigate as well? Well. I don't think I think I'm getting better at yep. standing back and going this is a this is a good achievement you've done good here KP but I yep. don't think I'm as good as I should be I think I'm still fairly heavy and harsh on myself um, and that's again just something that I'm I'm working on and something that I'm conscious of so I'm actively trying to be nicer to myself um, when I was in New Zealand you know New Zealand is very small yep. our music industry is very small um I've spent years wondering what genre I fit into because I love so many and it isn't actually until I've arrived in London that I've realized the reason that I struggle so much is because I can do so many different genres um so working that out it was quite hard towards the end of New Zealand because I felt like I was being put in various boxes and there also wasn't the correct box for me so I was never quite comfortable with with where I was um, and then coming to London no one really asks you the genre question no one asks you that they just ask to hear your music and they just ask like what do you do do you sing do you play in a band do you play guitar do you um, do top lines and do you write for other people and they're interested in what you do as opposed to what boxes you tick so for time. me that was a really yeah it was different and I'm not bagging on New Zealand at all it's just different yep. um and so over here you know I've got a few festivals that I'm playing this summer which is really great um I songwrite for other people I top line for um for various publishing companies and projects and that sort of thing I've just come back from Morocco on a songwriting retreat with a bunch of I think there was like 18 of us from all over the place. Um, and we spent four days songwriting to different commercial briefs. And so for me, all of that reinforces that one, I really love to songwrite, whether it's for myself or for other people, it's equally as joyful either way, because I'm getting to connect with people. Um, but also I have found that what music I do that's okay I don't need to actually be in a box um and I read I'm reading a book at the moment um called a seat at the table or something along those lines and it's about women in the music industry and I just finished a chapter on Maggie Rogers and she said that she was so she didn't know what genre she fit in because she was this kid who grew up playing like a harp and a violin and a guitar or something rather or the piano and she would write folk songs and then she went to New York and she found um, like house music and she didn't know where she fit and then when she realized that she can actually just do whatever she wants that's when everything opened for her and I've I've realized that and I'm still realizing that um, so what I've long-winded way what I'm getting at is that London has been the best learning 
experience ever because they are so open and so accepting of different music. Um, and I, you know, I'm lucky. I only really meet nice people in the industry. I know that there's as many good, there are as many not so good, but I've made the, the friends that I have here from music, they're just so beautiful, so accepting, so lovely. Um, I feel very, I feel very blessed to be in the position that I'm in now. Yeah, and I'm just going to put a bit of a bit of a, a, a call out there too because I think I believe in energies, and I think you know, having worked with you, you you give us such a positive and such a loving energy that it's going to come to you. You know, it would be different if you were sarcastic and negative the whole time. You'd probably get that in your life. Yeah, <laughs> I'm a bit Maybe sarcastic. I'll, 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 you know, I can be a bit sarcastic. <laughs> with, with a smile, with a smile on your face, you know. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. So I you never know, mean it, it seriously. No, exactly. We just laugh at your sarcasm, which is great. It's even better. I'm like, are you being serious? I don't know. Um, so, you know, I think you need to you acknowledge that as well. But I, I love that because you go from, you know, a box filled world to a place where you can actually just be yourself, which is, and again, there is no right or wrong. There is no right or wrong. You know, the world is, the world yeah. works in different just, spaces. It you is know? how it is. It is how it is. And, you know, you go away, you go, right, cool. And, and I think it's really, it's actually quite good. There's different places because imagine if, imagine if New Zealand space, if, 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 I'm saying this is about it could be anybody. Imagine you're in a place where you could do whatever you wanted and then you actually get so lost and then you go to a place where there's boxes and like, no, yeah. what do I do? It's, it's you know, it's a, it's a crazy, yeah. crazy world. Yeah. I think, Tana, you, you might have experienced that as well because and I'm, and I'm going to, and I'm going to come back to Tana here because I'm going to talk about Maori Ma- Ma- culture and, you know, being put into a box and how, because you're Maori, you get put into a box straight away, but actually you didn't really pick that up until later on in your life and it's, it's changed the way you look at not just yourself, but also the way you look at the world. And I think specifically when you were doing your role as the specs president, that really hit home for you. Yeah, for sure. And I think that's the thing is these, you know, these labels are out here, but it's also about how you navigate that and whether you choose to accept that or whether you just choose to say, hey, I can change the narrative. And, you know, like it's easy to sit into those norms and be like, okay, this is the way it is and this is the way it's always going to be. Or you can go, okay, I can do something and actually change it. And not just for me, but for the people I'm helping or the, you know, the reasons I'm doing it. And I think, you know, with that, it does feel weird to begin with because you go, okay, how have, you know, how have people in the past just sat here and kind of accepted it? And why, you know, why am I feeling this way of, I want to change things. And surely there must have been someone else that was willing to do it, but that shouldn't be a negative for you. It should be, okay, it's awesome that I want to do these things. And then, yeah, it's just taking that step to do it, which is the real the real driver, right? Like in any sense of what you're doing, it's that urgency to go, okay, I'm willing to change this. And whether it's going to be positive or negative, you've at least, you know, taken up that opportunity to go, hey, let's try something different. Yeah, and, and for both of you, you know, both you both tried something different and both of you, it thinks they've worked out not all the time, but they've worked out in a way that you go actually there's lots of learnings from 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 those steps there, which is really, really great. Then ask you a hard question, okay. If you, if you have to choose one of your own favorite songs, what would it be? Uh, oh. no, it's probably one that I haven't released yet. Oh, um, I'm excited already. So, yeah. So I'm I'm sitting on a bunch of songs that I've written with some wonderful people. Um and and yeah i think my favorite is one that i haven't released yet or there'd be two actually that are my favorite i haven't released them yet but i plan to um so so they will be out but but yeah i i i would have said stay probably um which is you know obviously it's out but with these two new songs i'm like oh they're they're a lot like I, you know, like I've I've redefined my sound again, um, yeah. and I I really like the feel of these two songs. So yeah. And that, that was a hard question. That was a hard question because I guess you know every song you're growing as a person. You know you had perfect, which is amazing, and then you have stay, which is even like every song that you produce as a listener, you go wow wow this is crazy. Um, so that was a bit of a trick question. I was actually been trying to see what you're gonna release next. To be honest, but that's I'll, yeah. I'll just wait. Yeah. Thank everyone else. Well played, PJ. <laughs> Well played. <laughs> um, let's talk about stuff for our listeners out there. I don't know if you can see if you're watching the video. I have a t-shirt, which is KP, KP, KP. This, I need a snack. Do you want to talk about that there, KP? I know we spoke about that at the start, but the listeners didn't hear that. Let's talk about that there. I need a snack. Yeah, so I thought 
of putting out a t-shirt that best uh, represented me. Um, so anyone who knows me knows that I love to eat. I love to try all sorts of food. Um, growing up as a Filipino, I have I was always introduced to different flavors and different ways of cooking and, and dressing a dish. Um, so I think that's been a pretty important part of, of my growing up. So I eat a lot and I like eating with people. And I don't usually, especially in London, I never go anywhere without some form of snack in my bag because you never know where you'll end up and where uh, you'll be in a dire situation where you need something to eat. And I thought I need a snack. That is a line that I say a lot when I am upset and my fiance might ask what I need and I'll say I need a snack. And so that's something that he can provide and it's a way that he can help and it's a way that I can look after myself. And so I thought I'd put it put it on a t-shirt um, and people liked it and it's universal. We all need to eat. We all need a snack. When we feel sad, we go and get something to eat. On a Sunday, if you've had a big night out, you go down to Fatty Lane and get yourself some KFC or some some Domino's. Taya, you're, you're, you're nodding your head like you know what's up. Like you've done this before. Um, and so, yeah, I just think it was it was a fun way to kind of introduce myself to people. Um, with like it means something to me I need a snack it's not just a bit of a piss take it's it, it, it's important to me this is how I take care of myself yeah and, and, and those around you that you that you that you love and care about right you know it's because yeah. I know when, when you were in the office I, I still remember the first time I met you the first the very first time I met you what did we do we went and had some, some we went and got a snack <laughs> exactly that's exactly what we did yeah on we, day we one. got to, we got some food, yeah, and yeah. Uh, there's there's always snacks because you never know who's having a really shitty day, and you might not be able to fix what is going on in their in their life. But if you chances are if you put a snack in front of them, they will reach out for it, even if they are hungry or whatever, and it will provide them some sort of comfort. And sometimes we just need something to tangibly hold, whether it's some French fries or whether it's. I don't know, a salad or a burger or some biscuits, whatever. Um, just something that you can hold, I think. And something that you can offer somebody is also a really nice way to serve people. Yeah, totally. Because um, everybody likes food. You know, they might not like what you give them, but they will take it and go, right, cool. It just, it just humanizes us all, right? It just humanizes us. Yeah. You know, we, we, we have different colors. We have, we have different genders. We have all these differences. At the end of the day, we all need to eat. Doesn't matter. Doesn't we matter. all need to eat. Yeah. yeah. And we're, we're all, all eating rest. at some stage. At this, yeah, yeah. We all need to rest and yeah. we all need to eat. And at, at some stage, we are all eating at the same time. You know, even wherever we are in the world, chances are we're eating something at the same time as somebody else because we've all got that same basic human need to be yeah. to be fed. That's right. It's actually beautiful. So, um, yeah, if you release some of those, hopefully our listeners will jump on and, and, and purchase those because I think they're very cool. Yeah, we you did them as a, as a limited edition, but I think I want to bring them back just for like another short wee stint just, just to get them out there again. Yeah, so listeners have a look out because you could be wearing one of these wherever you're in the country or in the world. Why not, right? Why not? Why not? Why um, not? Exactly. Let's talk about those, those come up from festivals. Is that something really cool and exciting for you? You know, um, what what's coming up for you, KP? So, what are we in now? April. I've got. Um, I'm opening for a friend of mine. His name is Cap Carter. He's a wonderful um, artist from Australia. Um, he's also Filipino, so we bonded over that when we first met back in 2017. We both played a gig in someone's basement in Auckland. And we just stayed in touch and we're a bit like family now. So I'm opening for him. He's doing a, a world tour. Um, and then in summer, um, I've got a few, I've got a few shows. There's a few, I can't quite, yep. there's one I can't say just yet. Um, but there's a few festivals. There's some singer songwriters in the round um, appearances, which are really nice. They're probably my favorite sort of, sort of show. Um, so I, I, I'm not sure if people know a, sing, a songwriter in the round is when you've got, say, four or five artists in line on stage. So everyone's on stage at the same time. 
and each person goes and they'll play a song and they'll talk a bit about it and there'll be banter between the artists on stage you know if um, someone's a guitarist they might start noodling in your song and, and accompanying you and, and it you know people can join in if they want and it's just a really the crowds are always very receptive and they listen to what you have to say so those are always my favorite sorts of sorts of performances um and then there's also new music coming out that people can uh, get amongst hopefully and enjoy and hopefully there's a trip back home at the end of the year for some shows as well so yeah when you list it all off you're like oh actually i've got heaps going on um so so yeah and the reason I ask the question is because I'm going to segue right back to the very first question that I asked you. If I said to 18-year-old Kylie Price like, that you'll be doing this, you'd be having all these shows, you'd be in the UK doing this, what would you have said to me? Yes, so the London thing, yeah, okay, cool, that, that may or may not have been overseas, but the shows and the experience that you could be having, what would you have said to someone that asked that question? Um, I think knowing who I was at 18, I probably wouldn't have believed that I could do that um, because I didn't have the confidence in myself to do so but you would have sparked um, a thought in me of what if and I think there's a lot of power in the two words that make what if and that would have always been at the back of my mind like what if I, I am going around the world playing shows and releasing music and that was always one of the things I really wanted to do was be someone who was always traveling because of music I got to see the world and experience different cultures and different demographics of people because I did music and I I think if you had said that to me at 18 you would have sparked the what if I might have said to you okay PJ whatever yeah great shout but a part of me would have gone yeah but what if he's correct like what if you actually could do that so again, you would have inspired hope, which I think is yeah. one of the greatest things you can you can give somebody. And what I love about that, there's two things there because um, I'm going to touch back. So we all love to eat, we need to rest, but also humans around the world, music. You know, whether we like it or not, yeah. music we, it connects us all. It's a universal language. You know, you might not understand what the words are, but hey, it, it sparks something yeah. in you, right? Yeah, which is pretty crazy. Yeah, art is art is is, is crazy because you know we don't do it because we are going to make millions um but it's the thing that people listen to when they're upset it's the thing that before a rugby game you've got your headphones on you always see the all blacks um or the black ferns with with headphones on before they go and play a game you it's what probably makes you cry in a Grey's Anatomy episode and that really dramatic part of the of the of the episode and they play a really sad song or a really angry song or whatever and it's the part that gets you in the feels um the world needs art and often we are looked down upon because it's not a real job but it's the first thing people grab when they need when they need something when they need to go to the gym when they're going for a walk it's the same as podcasts it's a way to connect and a way to communicate with people um, yeah. And I think it's the most important job. I think it's the most um, wonderful way that I can give back to the world and hopefully leave it in a better place than how it was before before me. So that's what, I totally agree with you. I think I think we forget about that, and I think you know, and and, and the danger is, like like you said just before, you don't going to make millions, and people then go, oh, I'm not going to. F-. And I see there's, there's lots of young people. I see so much amazing talent. But then they decide to go to university to do a science because this is what's supposed to get them a job. And like, we oh, see this. Yeah. <laughs> we, how many kids did we would we see, and they would come in and they'd go, oh, "I'm going to study law." And you go, yeah. "Why are you studying law? You're a, a phenomenal artist, or you're a phenomenal sports person, but why are you doing law?" And they would say, "Oh well, you know, I just want, I just want a backup, or I want." My mum said I had to go do this, or um you know oh being an artist or being a sports person is not a real job yeah. and it's like, but it is it's so important yeah it's it's so it's so, it's so crazy it's pretty sad you know when you see this but then what i what i when i do get joy is when those young people realize in the second of the third year that actually this is not lighting my fire anymore 
-hmm. and then they go back to the fire, whatever the fire was, which, which nine times is going to be an art. When I say an art, I mean, it's either, it's either going to be painting, drawing, even cooking. Cooking is an art, you know, all the, those yeah. things. Yeah, really cooking's great. Cooking. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the second thing that you raised there was the what if. And the reason I bring that is because you put up the what if in the positive sense, but 99% of people out there will go what if in a negative sense. You know, the people that I work with, and you talk about they'll go what if i'll not give an example i got a, I got a message today from a young person that got their their hubs results back and they're like oh uh, they're like oh i got this grade yet what if it's not good enough but the grade is fantastic the grade is fantastic unfortunately we have we are geared to the what if not we humans the psyche has gone what if and went to the negative space but i loved how you swore that around actually what if positive and I wish more people would think about yeah. that. But but it's hard. It's hard to do that, right? It's hard to do that. You've got to have awareness of your mind. Yeah, I. Yeah, I I definitely was not always a what if positive person. I was very much the what if, what if I fail? Which for yeah. years is why I didn't try and why I didn't put myself out there because I thought what if I fail, and at least if I don't try, then I, you know, I can't be disappointed, but then you start living you don't live your best life and you also don't give yourself the opportunity to grow with a with a what if I fail but what okay. if you succeed and I remember getting into a, a discussion for 40 minutes with my therapist with what if and I said oh what if I fail and he was like yeah but what if you don't and I was like yeah but what if I do and he's like yeah but what if you don't and we went backwards and forwards and I actually had no defense against his but what if you don't Yep. like it I had nothing to say back to it and after that I was that that started me going yeah but what if what if I don't fail yeah. what if I don't and so yeah. after that that kind of changed my whole mindset on it yeah and, and you need something to challenge you right because it's so easy for us to live in that what if I, I what if I fail what if I don't do what if I don't pass what if this doesn't work out and you know it's the same thing. And when I when I started my little coaching thing, I was I mean I know my stuff, but I was so afraid to put the stuff out there. And I was like, what if nobody likes my stuff? What if nobody like actually who cares? Nobody likes my stuff. Whatever, who cares? What's the worst that could happen? I can just change it. But it's so hard. You need someone to challenge you, and that only happened because one of my coaches challenged yeah. me and said, okay, cool. Hey, what's the worst thing that could happen? Nobody likes your post. Okay, cool. Does the world ended? Yeah. No. Okay, cool. So yeah. I really like, I like it doesn't, and it doesn't say anything about you. Like it, yeah. it doesn't mean that you are any less because people didn't vibe with it. It, yeah. you know, it, you tr you tried. It didn't work. You can try something again. We can yeah. always try again. Yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. Which is, which is, which is. I mean, that's the truth, right? You can always try. You can always try again. Kathy, okay, we've been talking for almost an hour, and I'm sure we could keep talking forever and ever and ever. Um, but what we're going to do is we're going to round up the podcast with our favorite question. And there's so much in this podcast here, which I mean, there's so much to take away and we look forward to the reels that Hannah is going to produce. The question I have for you is this past, this podcast is called Bust of Knowledge. And every, every week we ask our guests to share one piece of knowledge that we could put into a basket that our listeners could listen to. What piece of knowledge would you like to share with the world that you, that, that, that is, that is KP? Oh, oh, can I have, can I have two? You can have two. Okay? You can have two because it's Good Friday. That's my birthday. Have, wait, so can, have can I have three? I'll have three because it took three days for Jesus to rise. So one basket of knowledge for each day. Go um, ahead. The first yeah, we'll one, love Easter. The first, <laughs> the first one is when you are upset, when you're anxious, or when you're crying, have a glass of water because you have to slow your heart rate down in order to actually drink the glass of water. So have a glass of water you have to stop in order to physically do it um the second thing is never leave the house without a snack you might think that's a piss take but it is not you never know when you'll find someone who is hungry or when you find yourself in a situation of you've missed the bus or you've missed the train or whatever and you're really hungry and there's no food but then you remember that you packed ahead and you thought of yourself your future self um pack a snack and then the third thing I would say is there is always hope, even when it's dire. And I speak about that from someone who has been in dire situations down to the minutes. Um, there is always hope. You, you might not think that your speck of hope has any power, but if you, if you lean into it, 
and you allow that hope to take over things can happen like and and you you are deserving of a great life and i think there is such power and hope don't don't throw it away or push it to the side as if it doesn't matter because it might just be a tiny bit but it's it's so powerful it's concentrated it, the, the smallest bit can be so powerful so yeah there are my three things of knowledge amazing of three things were consumption based <laughs> of water <laughs> and snacks but, but hey, practical, practical, right? Two pieces of practical. This is great. Yeah. Practical stuff is isn't, isn't great stuff. Have, yeah, beautiful. Have you two eaten? Have you had dinner yet? Yeah, it's ten o'clock. What it's did you 10. have for dinner? Did you? What did you have for dinner? Tony, what did you have for dinner, Tony? Oh, I had like a stir fry rice meal. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> what did you have, BJ? And I had a curry because you know why not? Oh, <laughs> what yeah. sort of curry? I had a, a chicken curry. Chicken oh. curry, yeah. Yeah. What, 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 have you have you had breakfast i've had breakfast i'm about to go out and get some some sushi i think but for breakfast we had eggs um with a bit of garlic a bit of tomato on they have these things in the uk with their hash brown waffles so they're in the shape oh. of a waffle but they're like shredded potato like hash browns so i air fried a couple of those and and we had those un, underneath because i'm also out of bread so yeah, you do what amazing. you can with what you've got. <laughs> yeah, it sounds amazing. Amazing. Um, KP, Kelly Price, um, this has been a fantastic, fantastic episode. Thank you so much for jumping on. And uh, this is also pretty special for me. Even though it's Good Friday, it's also my birthday. So this is like a great, great present is to chat, chat with you on, on my birthday. So oh, thanks, thanks KP. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Birthday. Thank you. Oh, you. You kept that so quiet. Oh, wow. Oh. <laughs> Yes, silly um, sausage. Oh, happy birthday. Are you 21? 21. We'll take that. 21. Maybe 22. <laughs> maybe 22, but I'll go 21 today. <laughs> awesome. Uh, thanks, thanks, KP. Um, anything you want to add, Tony, before we round up? Uh, I think this has been an awesome podcast. Um, I've definitely taken a lot away from it. And I think it's, yeah, it's helped me reflect on a lot, but also, you know, so, yeah, some of these narratives that I think, you know, we always play into you've made me re-question, you know, and rethink some of the things of why we're doing. And I think, you know, talking about, you know, this what if, a lot of the times you're right, we do look at it as a negative sense, but I think at the same token, you know, the reason we have that fear is because we care about what we d we're we doing. And so that's another positive in itself that we can take away from it is, you know, we question ourselves and that's hard and we challenge ourselves, but it's because we're so passionate about what we're doing. You're beautiful. Beautiful. So this is out there. Um, hopefully you found something really interesting today. If you haven't, you need to listen to this podcast again because I promise you, you have missed listening to it. Um, we'd love to thank Kylie, Kylie Price, KP, um, the legend um, for jumping on today. And we look forward to um, your new music. And what we'll do is in the show notes, we'll put out your, your uh, website and Instagram page so listeners can have a listen to click and follow you and see what you're up to and if they if you do release some of these bad boys here they can jump on and also try and get one of those yeah, um thank you so much KB. thank we, you thank you for your time no worries um to everyone take it easy and don't forget as always um, have a fantastic safe easter if you are doing ramadan um have happy ramadan and enjoy that and do what you need to do and when ramadan breaks like kylie says make sure you have a snack yeah because you have to have that there gotta eat gotta eat um till next time take care be safe and keep smiling Bye, everybody. Thank you for listening to Baskets of Knowledge. Yeah, we hope that you found something useful to put into your basket of knowledge. And as we said before, remember to put something little into your baskets of knowledge every week. And as always, feel free to like, comment, and share this podcast. Thanks, everybody. Bye.